Hello and welcome back to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. This show's Wildest Hits series has officially concluded. The episodes ranged across the show's two and a half year lifespan with diverse topics and guests. In case you missed an episode and would like to hear a little snippet before diving into the full thing, check out these highlights and then go back to the episode that piques your interest the most. All right, here we go. First, in the Wildest Hits series, we revisited a quite eye-opening conversation with Michael Vogler, co-founder of Mandalau Elephant Conservation in Laos. Um... Yeah, kind of a joint opportunity between a Denver-based nonprofit called the Global Livingston Institute. Um, And they've been bringing uh, students and community leaders down to Uganda and Rwanda for well over 10 years now. Um, One of my close friends started it. Uh, So it was kind of an opportunity with them and the Mountain Gorilla organization. So we kind of partnered together and spent a good amount of time there, about a year in between the DRC, Rwanda and Uganda. Uh, And really that was just based on community-based development work. Mm -hmm. So that was working with, it's the the Batwa people. It's actually the only indigenous group of people in kind of Central Africa. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, and one of the most displaced groups. I mean, a lot of people talk about the the genocide in Rwanda and the DRC between the Hutus and the Tutsis, and they were fighting, but the Batwa were, they were fighting all, both the Hutus and the Tutsis were fighting Mm -hmm. the, the Batwa. So they're the most like, displace like disenfranchised group of people living in the country and they were the ones that were still in volcanoes national park or virunga national park where the gorillas are they were the last ones that were hunter gatherers that when they really started implementing strict rules that no one was allowed in the park they kicked all of them out which you know in order to protect the gorillas they had to do it there just was not enough space left for for humans and elephants to kind of coexist within that area. But they didn't give them the tools to succeed in life after kicking them out. So Mm. they had no education, really no even basic skills for farming, no real sense of, you know, clean water systems. I mean, they they were used to living off the jungle. So the Batwa are basically living around the fringes of all of the national parks in Uganda as well, um, around Bawindi, uh, basically all the areas that they still have mountain gorillas. And a lot of our work was farming based. It was building small schoolhouses. It was delivering basic medical care and treatment and trying to raise it to a standard where they could actually survive. I mean, I would love to say it was more than that. I would love to say thrive, but you know, with our limited resources and what we had available it was more just giving them the opportunity to at least exist somewhat comfortably Mm. um maybe not by most western standards it wouldn't be a comfortable life but uh certainly a step up from from where they were so trying to assimilate them into normal rwandan culture so i didn't get to work hands-on with gorillas that's a pretty specific field i got to see them a a few times that's awesome hiking up in the park Uh, take some treks I took some treks. Yeah, and that was uh, was a very eye-opening experience, to say the least. It uh, some pretty traumatic things that I had to to see and had to... Do you want to share any of those? Um, Probably not too much depth. Okay, yeah. Stuff I like to really um, rehash too much, but uh, just uh, extreme poverty uh, to a level that I don't think exists many places and just... uh, I don't know if I'd call them like human right crimes. Cause it's not necessarily a crime, but just uh, it's some pretty heartbreaking stuff. Mm-hmm. What what these people were living through. Um, so I like to think that we made somewhat a, a, of a difference there. Helped some people's lives, and you know, at the same time, it is in order to protect the forest and the gorillas, and you know, give them the opportunity to not go into the park and chop down trees and, you know, go poach animals or gorillas, whatever it is. So yeah, it was kind of like an all inclusive conservation project. Um, after that, I came back to the States for a little bit, was working some random jobs up in Alaska, 
um, tour guide and mountain bike tour guide and just kind of random stuff. And I had fallen in love with Southeast Asia after uh, working with the Orangutan Foundation and traveled around for a few months. And yeah, I went to Laos and I fell in love with the place. I mean, Southeast Asia has been like a tourist hotspot destination for about a decade and decades. So, you know, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, to some extent, they're all very well traveled. It's not a, you know, and it's changed the culture in those countries, I think, pretty significantly. There's a lot more Western influence, a lot more of the travel experiences catered towards Western comforts. It's not a, you know, you go to Thailand and I feel like oftentimes you meet one of the locals and they're smiling at you because they know it's good for your econ their economy and they know it's money's coming in. Whereas I think Laos has remained off that beaten path for travelers and the smiles are still, still genuine. They're still like, oh my God, you want to come and see our country? They're like, <laughs> so excited to, Amazing. to to meet like a foreigner who's, you know, they want to talk, they want to like, so it's it, it still remained like, it still kind of has its core essence, you know, it's traditional like styles. Um, and yeah, I saw some, went to an elephant sanctuary there and it was just awful. You know, all the elephants on short chains are the ones that weren't, you know, whole families on their back and they just do these repetitive, you know, little loops with the elephants and the hot sun and families on their backs. And it was not, they weren't rescuing the elephants. It was, they were turning a profit, like bringing a few tourism and it was all very disingenuous and heartbreaking mm -hmm. to say the least. So I didn't have experience with elephants before, but I really wanted to get out of the U.S. I wanted to kind of start my own project and that was kind of eye-opening. It's like, well, you know, there's certainly, this can be done in a much, in a much better way, a way that's actually good for the elephants. And that's kind of what spurred uh, me and one of my really good buddies to start investigating. We spent, I don't know, six months traveling the country and looking for land and making contacts and figuring out the legalities of opening a project there. You know, it's a pretty strict communist government. Still, yeah, how so. did, that's actually one of my big questions. Like, if you wouldn't mind diving into that a little more, how did, how did you do that? How long did it take? So we ended up meeting this gentleman, a German guy who'd been living in Laos for 15, 20 years. He'd opened up a couple of guest houses, a restaurant, you know, spoke the language fluently, had good contacts, and we kind of hit it off with him. And he was excited to meet two younger guys who were interested in creating like a new project. So he was like, yeah, let's, let's do this together. Let's, let's build. So he kind of like got us the, the fast line into procuring business licenses and foreign work permits and, you know, helping us find land and dealing with all of the, all of those issues that we really didn't have any experience with. Mm -hmm. So he definitely helped us move things along quite quickly. I won't go into it too much depth, but it came apparent like kind of right when we were opening up that his primary focus was making as much money as possible and didn't care so much about the elephants themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so our relationship ended fairly quickly after it started. Uh, so he's no longer part of the organization. Did you like buy his, his portion of the business? Is that how you were able to like cut ties? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we bought him out of the company. One of my other really good friends who grew up here in Colorado as well uh, was able to purchase his shares. Oh, wow. And he's, uh, he's over there now kind of overseeing things, but he's been with us for, yeah, four years now, four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like a, I guess I consider them my family, like yeah. a couple, couple of my best friends. So it's like a, like a little family business now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the government is open. They want to increase like economic revenue coming through the country. So they are open to foreign investment and having people come in and things that will draw on more tourists. So that part isn't exactly the most difficult, but it's, our concept of what we want to do with elephants. And it's significantly different than what's traditionally done with elephants in Laos. So that's really where the fighting has begun or the challenges have, you know, um, we can get into this in a little bit more, but the, the training aspect with our baby bull, you know, we had letters from 
the prime minister's office that we had to send him down for traditional training and breaking process. It was a legal requirement, even though we owned him, it was our elephant. Of course we refused, but that's, you know, stuff like that. And they didn't really understand the concept of doing something for the elephants. I think they thought we were just just some random Westerners coming in who wanted to do something different. They didn't understand the concept of treating elephants ethically. And now that we've started doing it, in some ways it sheds bad light onto all of the other elephant stuff that's going on. Mm. So it's raised tensions that they're almost like coming at us saying that like, because we're doing this, it's saying that they're doing it the wrong way. So we've been faced with some backlash. Second in the Wildest Hits series, we heard the show's most philosophical and thought-provoking episode with John Linnell, PhD, all about the realities of coexisting with predators. So I think the next natural question that I would love to ask you is you've written a lot about coexistence. And this is a relatively new term to the field of conservation. So to you, what do you what is coexistence in your eyes from your definition? And do you actually think it's possible to reach? I, I guess we have to take a little step back, first of all, because the the coexistence kind of discourse, it grew out of the conflict discourse. And conflicts are like the first thing that kind of come to mind when you start talking about kind of predator conservation, especially like in human dominated landscapes, right? And I guess we used a huge amount of time in the 90s and the early 2000s trying to get to grips with kind of human wildlife conflicts. You know, like the early work was connected very much kind of focusing on the, the proximate the tactile things, like, for example, wolves who kill sheep, right? And, you know, and all the efforts of, well, how do you modify livestock husbandry to, to prevent this? You know, you had the same issue, say, with bears and garbage. You know, how do you keep the bears out of the garbage bins? How do you stop the bears destroying beehives? All these type of things. And then this work kind of led, I think, to a deeper insight into the importance of social conflicts, where there even... In the absence of an economic conflict, you still have this sort of opposition of kind of rural areas against the return of large and predators. So part of that may be based around fear, you know, and, and certainly like a wolf or a bear, they are kind of potentially dangerous, right? Then they're, they're big predators with teeth. They kill much bigger things for a living. And, and humans are actually pretty wimpy things. You know, we don't really have much to stand up with. So but it's much more than the, those things, you know, that the research can really identified how these species were becoming symbolic issues linked to much wider discourses of kind of social change. Mm. You know, that sort of you have all of these kind of unconflicts, you know, between the more modern and more traditional styles, between rural and urban, between different political values, all sorts of different divisions exist there. And... <laughs> Depending on where we are, we pick on different kind of symbolic issues, right? Like the migration is a huge issue, right? Everywhere, you know, abortion is a big issue in the US, you know, other countries have their issues that tend to become highly symbolic. And wolves and bears, especially, very quickly tend to get sucked into these wider social and kind of, kind of political debates, you know, and awfully much in the same way, actually, as migrants or kind of refugees. You know, it's something from the outside, it's perceived as being threatening, it's a change. And then we immediately blame them for everything else that's going wrong in the world. Hmm. It, you know, like in a kind of European kind of rural context where there's a huge kind of change in rural life ongoing since 1980s. You know, we blame you know, the closing of the post office, the closing of the local school, the fact there's not a priest in the church every Sunday anymore. You know, all of these changes, you know, the arrival of the Internet, you know, the fact that your beer costs twice as much, you know, every possible social change you can think of, you tend to blame it on something external. Like the wolf came back and everything went to hell. 
So you have these kind of symbolic issues, which are not really about the real wolf or the real bear or the real lynx, but about the symbolic one. So by the 2000s, we were understanding that these human and wildlife conflicts were a composite of, you know, real issues and economic issues and these much more wider social symbolic issues. And that was kind of, kind of really good that we now understood what the problem was. The question was, how do you move beyond this? And what do we try to get to? What does kind of sort of a successful conservation situation look like? And I'm guessing that this maturing of our understanding of conflict led us to realize that we were never actually going to solve all conflicts, hmm. that we could maybe protect sheep better. We could maybe help farmers, you know, use electric fences or adopt livestock guarding dogs and different practices that maybe would bring the loss of livestock down to a minimum. You know, and we know how to make garbage bins that the bears can't get into. We know how to protect beehives. So those aspects of conflict you can work with. But these wider social issues, you know, they are never going to change, right? You know, because all of our societies involve kind of political differences. We have different values, you know. We've been having elections, you know, every four or five years for on centers now, and we still haven't agreed on who's going to run the country, you know, because we change and different people have different views. You know, same with sport, right? You know, how many Super Bowl finals have you had each year? You still haven't worked out who's the best team, right? <laughs> right. You know, every four years we have the World Cup or we have the, the Olympic Games and we still, you know, compete, try to see who's best. And politics and values are the same. We're never going to agree. You know, what we have maybe done is we found at least kind of superficially less damaging ways to resolve our disagreements. But we're not going to agree. And predators will always be one of the elements in these debates, you know, because they are so symbolic that we're bound to just to instrumentalize them in wider political and social debates. So those aspects of the conflict are never really going to be solved, right? They're just something which we have to try to channel them into less damaging and more acceptable channels. So like, for example, in a predator context, we could hope that people could take their disagreement through the democratic channels, rather than, say, going out and illegally killing or illegally reintroducing predators into landscapes. You know, that we try to keep it legal, if we can do. But certainly, we're never going to hope that people are going to agree. So this idea that, you know, or these kind of naive ideas that if you just have enough education, then everyone will love wolves or love mm. bears. You know, that's not going to happen, right? You know, some people are going to love them. Some people are going to hate them. Many people will be totally indifferent, you know. So it means that we're not really moving towards a world where we can even hope to have an absence of conflict. But we hopefully can move to a world where the conflicts are channeled into legal acceptable ways of kind of resolving differences. And that's kind of where this kind of coexistence idea has emerged from. That, you know, okay, this is sort of, if conflict is what we want to try to minimize or move a little bit away from, what do we move towards? And then people talk about kind of coexistence. And ever since that word has appeared, it's been really pulled into many different kind of directions with many people having very different views on it. You know, I think early on people had a very sort of simplistic idea that coexistence was the absence of conflict, mm. you know, and mm -hmm. like I said, that's not going to happen. Right. So kind of coexistence is now emerging as sort of a kind of dynamic kind of fluid state where conflicts are at least limited and that sort of the predators are back on the landscape sharing space with people but it's always going to be a fairly messy complicated dynamic kind of interactive thing it's not going to be a disney film let's say right it's going to be something much more complicated than that so i think it's very much an emerging concept that we're trying to fill it with kind of meaning and kind of definition we realize that it's going to look totally different in totally different places you know, just because the societies are totally different, the underlying acceptance for these species is going to be totally different. The the extent to which people are concerned about it will kind of vary. 
you know, you, you often see in countries which have real issues going on, like real issues of poverty and kind of armed conflict and human rights issues. For them, large predators simply become unimportant. You know, they have much more important things to focus on. In countries which are peaceful and doing well, then these species often become much more important because we don't have anything else to actually focus on. But also you have incredibly different kind of, kind of religious and cultural backgrounds. You know, I worked kind of, kind of quite a bit in India and it's totally baffling to understand the level of tolerance and acceptance that people have to live in the very close kind of proximity to very dangerous species like tigers, lions, slow bears, elephants, you know, and like to put that into like a European context, we simply shake our heads and say, how can you live so close to these dangerous things? And they just look back and say, well, that's how it is, you know, or the elephants are gods, you know, you can't kill God. Can't kill so, the Ganesh. <laughs> yeah. No, so it's, 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 so this also, I think, has made the whole coexistence concept very difficult to understand because it looks so different in so different places. And it is literally, I think, a work in progress because if you look back through history, we've never really tried it before. You know, we, we've had a one goal through history which has been largely extermination, like not total, not everywhere, but that has been the main goal. And we were really good at achieving that goal. And now for the last maybe 50 years, we've moved over to this new goal of kind of coexistence. And we really are very fresh at working out how that looks. So I think this really much is a work in progress. Next in the Wildest Hits series, we traveled all the way to the furthest southern continent on the planet and learned how Michelle LaRue, PhD, studies penguins and seals using tools from space. Maybe just... Let's take this big picture. What exactly do you do? And how did all of this come together? Maybe at this point in your life? Oh God. So I ask my, I'm like, what do I do for a living? I don't even know. <laughs> I, asked myself like, the same thing. I know. Like, what is it that I do? I answer emails. That's what I do. <laughs> that's that's the actual answer. What have I been trained to do? That's a different question. So what I've been trained to do is, you know, as a wildlife ecologist, spatial ecologist, what I've been trained to do is to kind of figure out where animals are how many there are and why they live in certain places over others and kind of just real generally that's that's what I do but along those lines the other thing that I do and and learn to do really well is to count them from space so that's so like looking at high resolution si satellite imagery that's been kind of my jam over the past 15 years or so is like trying to figure out how we can use new technology, high resolution satellite imagery to understand where what else seals live, where emperor penguins live, Adelie penguins, crab eater seals, um, and then even in the Arctic looking for like muskox and polar bears. So that's really the the work that I've been trying to kind of figure out as I as I go along. So it's looking at, you know, habitat and spatial distributions of animals. So that's essentially what I do is I try to figure out like <clears throat> for the past, I don't know, 10 years or so, I would say I've been trying to figure out how to use the, that technology to to understand what we're seeing, right? Because you can't just take an image and like count everything you see and then say that's how many there are. That's it's far more complicated than that. And so, so with all these different species, it's been a matter of like methodically figuring out what we can say with with the imagery and and what that then translates to as far as population trends, population estimates, um, habitat. You know what's going to happen in the future, that kind of a thing. So yeah, it's been a lot of uh, kind of trial and error, I would say, over the past 10 to 15 years or so. Yeah, and that's so cool because me not not really knowing about this type of research before I sat down with you, which is so cool. I would feel like this would give you access to areas that we probably normally couldn't survey, right, I would imagine? That is the most, like, that was the most exciting part of the realization that we could see these animals from a satellite image because it's like, oh my God, this completely changes everything because doing work in Antarctica, most of the animals that are studied at all, let alone like long-term studies are nearby research stations, right? So it's this like proximity to be able to physically mm. get to them, right? Well, Antarctica is huge, right? And the coastline <laughs> is thousands and thousands of miles long. And there's a lot of places where these animals could be. Um, and so there's a lot we're missing out on. And so if we can see and have this remote view, that completely changes everything. And so that was really 
probably one of the more exciting things for me as a scientist was having that realization of going like, oh my gosh, I have a background in wildlife ecology, like a passion for conservation, and I have these skills in, you know, remote sensing interpretation and GIS and seeing, you know, the little black dots on the white ice and realizing those are what else seals. It's like, oh, this changes everything. I'm like, oh my God, we can actually see the coastline. We can see these places that we can't physically get to and have for the first time the ability to know how many there are. And that's just, I mean, we just never had the, uh, the ability to do that. So it's really been really exciting. Do I chance remember like a specific moment when that happened or, or was that too finite of a moment? Like, do you, no, do you that, remember that I like definitely, yes, I, yes, I definitely remember the moment that I realized I was looking at seals from space. It was really exciting because it was, I was doing something else entirely, but I was looking at the high resolution imagery and I was looking at a place called Erebus Bay, which is really close to McMurdo Station, the largest Antarctic research base in Antarctica, and where the U.S. does their most of their research. And I was looking at the Erebus Glacier Tongue, which is this glacier that kind of juts out into the sea ice. And at the very end of the Glacier Tongue, I saw these little black dots. And I looked at that and I was like, that doesn't look like, because like sometimes uh, sea ice, when it starts to melt, it'll do that. It looks kind of mm-hmm. dirty, kind of. But it definitely wasn't that. And I was like, I am pretty sure that those are what else seals. And so I took a screenshot and I sent it to a couple of my colleagues and they said, yep, that's exactly what you're looking at. And then the rest is ancient history. Oh, so and cool. Say, yeah, it was around, great. Around what, just so we can help put the timeline together here, around what year was this? And this started to launch like what you started to do next? So that was in 2009, I think. And what was really interesting, so I realized pretty quickly that's what that was. And I talked to my boss and I was like, this is really exciting. Can I do a proof of concept? This would have been like kind of not exactly outside my job parameters, but Chant will say like adjacent to my my job parameters. And he's like, yeah, you should definitely go for it. And so I reached out to the people who were doing work on the ground. And I said, I've got this idea. Can we do a proof of concept, you know, just to say, like, I'm going to get a couple of images and count all the seals I see. And you tell me how many are actually there, which is the benefit of having mm. these long term projects, right, is it that are on the ground, because they could actually say, you know, in November of 2004, yeah, there actually were 130 there and you counted, you know, 75 or something. Right. So we had that ability to make those comparisons, which is really exciting. Um, and so that's what we did. And I remember the first time starting out at elf counting. So I looked at these images and literally went like one, two, three, four, counted all the seals that I could see. And then I was starting to compare the total number of animals that the, the group on the ground was counting. And it wasn't even close. Like I was way off. And uh, so I was like, oh, that's, that's disappointing. Like this isn't working. Like sometimes they were close, sometimes they weren't. But I had this and I still kind of have this, I kind of, it's kind of like woo woo a little bit. Like I don't really have a, a scientific reason or like a explanation for this, but I was just, I remember just staring at, at the numbers and I'm like, why isn't this working? And then I realized as I was staring at the numbers in the spreadsheet, I was like, there's adults, adult, adult females, adult males, and pups. I'm like, what if I just start looking at the adults? And then I got a little bit closer. And then I started looking at just the adult females. And then it was like almost spot on. And so that's when we realized pretty quickly that we were counting all of the adult females and nobody else. So we weren't able to see the pups on the high resolution images. They're too little. And largely speaking, most of the males were under the water. And so that was that kind of first realization of like, okay, this is who we're counting. We're not counting everybody. We're specifically counting the adult females. And so then that made sense. And then we went on from there. Fourth in the Wildest Hits series is the most controversial episode the show has released to date. In this episode, I sat down with Aaron Bott to discuss wolf management in the U.S. So, okay, so this was 1915. It sounds mm-hmm. like our the past people were hell efficient at getting rid of the wolf, as we all know. So let's fast forward in time to the 90s. Mm-hmm. What happened? Why were wolves reintroduced? What is like the sequence of events of pure hate for a long, long time. And how did we get to this point where we actually wanted to reintroduce them? Like, why did we even do that? Where do they come from? And what was that political situation that came after that? Because that political situation, I'm sure, heavily influenced what's been going on recently. So Mm -hmm. if you could give us a little bit of context 
of just what happened between 1915 and the 1990s. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, like I already mentioned once, humans like stories. And whether we admit it or not, we also have values and worldviews that essentially affect how we manage the world. Wolves were public enemy number one at the beginning of the 1900s. And the government worked very effectively at eradicating wolves and other predators throughout the West. And by the 1960s, there weren't any wolves left. And people began to question whether or not we had done the right thing. And I want to point out too that when people were eradicating wolves in the early 1900s, not everyone was on board with it. Um, a lot of very influential biologists, um, ecology was a new discipline at the time, but folks who were in ecology like uh, Aldo Leopold, the Miri brothers, Olas and Adolf Miri, they were concerned about how we were managing predators and they were critical of the government's approach. But without a lot of scientific backing to explain what might happen if we did take away predators from the landscape. But collectively, the nation began to question, man, we're losing wildness. We're losing things of aesthetic value. And we humans are responsible for the demise of a lot of this loss. So in the 1970s, bipartisan uh, laws were passed, including the Endangered Species Act, which was passed in 1973, which basically said, hey, it's immoral for people to stand by while a species is imperiled and goes extinct. And so it's our responsibility to work to mitigate the extinction of species wherever is possible. And in 1974, wolves were listed as being regionally extinct or threatened in the lower 48 states. Now, this is important for everyone to realize is that globally, wolves have never been on the verge of going extinct, which is one of the reasons why there's a lot of conflict, because people have still had a lot of animosity towards wolves. And they say, why are we protecting a species that is abundant in northern Canada and Siberia? Uh, it's not globally going extinct. It's just regionally been eradicated. And they argue for good reason. You know, it's, it's threatening my livestock and my livelihood. We should get rid of them. But anyway, in 1974, the U.S. decided that wolves in the lower 48 states um, needed to be protected and they ought to be restored wherever possible. And this is why we developed a criteria of where wolves could be restored and brought back. I told you already that wolves lived from central Mexico all the way up to the Arctic, from Pacific to Atlantic. They lived everywhere. So why did we choose the Northern Rockies? Why did we create the Northern Rocky Mountain uh, Recovery Plan? Well, it's because the Northern Rockies fit the bill in two ways. One, the Northern Rockies had enough prey available for wolves to consume. Other places like Kansas, Ohio, even Texas, they didn't have enough wild prey to adequately meet the needs of a recovering wolf population. Uh, we'd systematically eradicated not only the predators, but also we disrupted a lot of the prey. And the second reason why we chose the Northern Rockies is because there were fewer people. Wolves cause problems. It's, it's a fact of life that carnivores are difficult to live with. You can be a big wolf advocate, but if you're going to be pragmatic and a realist, you have to admit that they can be challenging to live with. And so we can't just restore them anywhere because people are going to be upset about it. So where can we put them where there's a low chance of conflict with humans? And where can we put them where they're going to eat native prey? And we chose the Northern Rockies. Historically, the Northern Rockies have been a place where not a lot of people have lived. Uh, the reason why is because up until the last 50 years or so, People had to make a living outside. And in the Northern Rockies, if you're farming and ranching, it's a tough place to make a living. That's why my family as Mormon pioneers picked it because they didn't want to be bothered by anyone. So all of that has since changed and we'll get into this in just a minute um, because now we can build an office and work indoors and we never have to go outside and we have heaters and air conditioners. But yeah, the Northern Rockies just seemed like a great place to, to put wolves. And so 
The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service created a recovery plan, which included northwestern Montana, which is Glacier National Park, essentially, as well as central Idaho, which is where the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness is. That's the largest wilderness area in the lower 48 states. And then Yellowstone National Park. So three essentially different meta populations that we would restore to the landscape. Now, I'm oversimplifying a very complicated story because this was in 1974 that we listed the wolf. 1987, we created the plan. But people, especially locals, were very upset at the idea of restoring wolves to an area that they had just the generation before worked very hard to, to eradicate these animals. So there was a lot of opposition. And during this time, conveniently perhaps, wolves actually began to tiptoe across the Canadian line into the United States from Alberta. And in the 1980s, wolves naturally recolonized northwestern Montana. So one of those three recovery sites that we had previously picked, boom, suddenly you've got wolves coming down on their own, no human intervention. That's the best case scenario, right? So at the very least, you're not spending tax dollars to bring wolves in. And studies have shown that people are more tolerant when nature acts versus when big brother government acts. And so wolves started to come down into Montana. That was great. Uh, we decided to wait and debate about whether or not we should let wolves continue to trickle down and see if they'd make it all the way to Yellowstone. But ultimately, the decision was made in the mid-90s that, nope, it would take too long. There's still too much animosity towards the wolf. Uh, we need to bring wolves back down and uh, restore them to these two other locations. So in 1995 and 1996, uh, we caught a total of 66 wolves in Alberta and British Columbia over the two years and released them at these two sites. So 31 wolves were released in Yellowstone National Park and, and 35 wolves released into central Idaho. And from those wolves, you have your wolf population today. So 66 wolves over a two year reintroduction phase and wolves being highly dynamic able to adapt to a new and in particular an unexploited uh, environment where elk and deer populations were abnormally high. No other wolves to compete with. And they were protected at first by the ESA, the Endangered Species Act. So they took off. And as I already said, wolves are highly prolific. Um, given the right environment, the right habitat, the right resources, they can increase at a bee rate of 20% every year, which is huge. Whoa. That's huge. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. So because of that, um, they actually met the delisting requirements by the early 2000s, 2002, I think. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, hey, it's, it's time to delist. But folks were not all convinced that that number, which we had placed in the northern Rocky Mountains, which was uh, about 150 wolves for each state, uh, Yellow, or excuse me, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, they were unconvinced that that was enough to have a viable population. And so legal battles back and forth. Finally, in 2011, um, attached to a congressional rider, wolves were delisted in the northern Rocky Mountain states, at least Idaho and, and Montana. And in 2017, they were delisted in Wyoming. So while we were fighting and hashing it out over whether wolves should be protected or not, their population continued to grow. And it grew well above the basement objectives for delisting. And at the beginning of 2021, there was an estimated 1,500 wolves in Idaho, 1,100 wolves in Montana, 300 wolves in Wyoming. And that's with a harvest. So during the last few years, people have been harvesting 30 to 35% of the wolves out of the state annually. But again, wolves are dynamic. And so they're able to take that hit and continue to, to grow and remain stable on the landscape. Lastly, in the Wildest Hits series, we went all the way back to episode 18 and met Sheridan Samano, an inspirational woman that has overcome several hurdles to see her conservation tourism vision come to life. So let's go back then to reefs to Rockies. Like, 
what it stands for, because obviously me and Bill are very close and how I immediately knew I was going to completely love you is that you have a different level at which you travel and see nature. Like it's going to be very conservation focused, environmental stewardship, all those things. So let's chat more about that. How do you tie that all together to ensure that your trips are making the least amount of impact and also just more about reefs to Rockies in general? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think the big thing is, you know, there, there's certainly impact, <clears throat> but let's talk about Costa Rica probably the most. Costa Rica up until a year ago was by far our number one selling destination mm -hmm. for new clients. Now, it, I knew it. I know Costa Rica in a way that there aren't a lot of travel consultants know Costa Rica because I worked, I started a study abroad program there. So I traveled with students. I still take one, I work with one school that I still travel with them every year. I love that school. And so actually registration for the fall trip just opened today. And I'm already, it looks like we're going to have enough interest for two back to, you know, back to back wow. trips. But it's, you know, it's kind of when we, when we first started really kind of plugging Costa Rica, we had Amy who was working with us at the time. We, we really, you know, you have, I don't know how familiar you are with Costa Rica and with many destinations, Costa Rica has a cer certificate for sustainable tourism. But by traveling on kind of a, initially with the students on kind of a lower budget scale, a lot of those companies have such small margins that what people don't tell you is it costs a lot of money, not only in time, but also money to get certified. It's not free. You can't just say, I want to be I'm doing these things and so I'm give me a certification based upon these green measures I'm doing, these sustainability measures I'm doing. You know, I'm using non-toxic cleaning, you know, I'm not spraying pesticides. That's not a free thing. But I was seeing <clears throat> staying at properties and working with people that they were as green as it as it came. One of my favorite lodges in Costa Rica is a property called El Romanso down in the Osa Peninsula. When we first started working with them, they they weren't certified because they didn't have, they ended up having to hire two interns to do it, to go through the certification process. <gasps> two interns. When they got their certification, they got the highest level of certification they could get. Well, that wasn't by accident. They had been doing it, they'd been walking the walk for years. And so we really preferentially try to, you're not going to see accommodations highlighted in our itineraries. Because that, it's not about what it is to me. Yes, I, as I've gotten older, I love staying at luxury accommodations, you know. I'm not a super big fan of where I'm going to stay in September for these two weeks with students, especially at one property that's completely off the grid. There's no electricity. You know, I hope my little uh, rechargeable battery fan works a little <laughs> bit to get some air. You know, it's not comfortable. But making sure that if, if a client comes to us and says... All I care about are the accommodations, and I just had a client recently that, that said that, that, that that's what the thing they keep hitting. They're probably not a good fit for us, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Like, there are other travel companies out there that that's their specialty. There's, no, there's nothing to knock that, but for us, it's about the underlying focus is the wildlife experience. It's about that portion, and by focusing on that, we tend to get them in in shoulder season or green season, you know, you Google what's green the best season. time, mm -hmm. you Google the, what's the best time to travel to Costa Rica. And if you look at companies that are running a lot of trips, they're running it from mid-December through March. You can't pay me to go to Costa Rica during that time. <laughs> I, I, I mean, honestly, like if, if somebody offered me a trip during that time, I would say, let's do it in May. Let's do it in September because not one, if you're a wildlife enthusiast, you want to be there when the animals are active and when the rainforest looks like rainforest, when it's all lush and green. Well, that's in the rainy season, the green season. And so we just, we, we kind of focus on all parts of it, making sure that we're working with as many in-country operators. When we first started, we booked everything direct. I booked before I even had staff where every transfer was booked directly. Every hotel was booked directly. It was very that's time. A it's a lot. <laughs> now a we lot. don't. Now we have a, a you know, a, a partner there that we trust implicitly. But even them going back to that level of knowledge, I've had to train them sometimes. So they'll try, like, I'll tell them the profile of what the clients are looking for, especially from a wildlife perspective. So I, you know, I kind of tell them, okay, I think they need to be here for this particular, if it's their birders or, you know, whatever it is. And for a long time, like, well, we don't really, I'm like, you need to develop 
a relationship here because these properties we've used in the past, they're great. It doesn't make sense to go to Monteverde for cloud forest when they could go to this other cloud forest environment where there's far less infrastructure and the wildlife viewing's better. So yeah, so it's that. It's just that, that whole approach of not needing to be big, not needing to be mass market, understanding that it's about the experience aspect of it. It's about supporting those local communities. I mean, even like we were just talking, I leave for back-to-back trips to California on Wednesday. I've already started looking at some of these clients have tried, one particular client has done this trip before. So I want to make sure she gets as many new experiences in it as she can. So I'm finding different restaurants. We always embed craft beer. You know, we'll probably at some point talk about burning No, we're going to talk about uh, that. You know, and, and those sorts of things. But, you know, how can I really get them into the sense of place too? I mean, you know, Costa Rica, you can stay, you can stay at some incredible high-end luxury lodges that feel like Costa Rica. You can also stay at really high-end properties that just feel like any other five-star resort. And you're, you know, that that in Mexico me, that, or something. Yeah, and, and 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 it doesn't that t- doesn't resonate. I want to know that I'm where I'm, I'm that I'm you know, in a sense of place. That's not just the comfort aspect, but all of it. You know, that I'm engaging with the employees, and there isn't this standoff portion. And and that is it. A snapshot of Rewildology's wildest hit series. If you have a question about any of these episodes, please submit your question in the Rewildologist Facebook group. Next month, I'm launching brand new conversations from all around the world, including a new country to the podcast list. Stay tuned to hear all of the good things coming soon. As always, I want to thank you for being a part of the Rewildology community. If you'd like to support the show, some zero-cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewatology newsletter at Rewatology.com, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves and hopefully keep this podcast out for you. (laughs) <laughs> consider making a monetary donation at rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your rewildology love at least 10 percent of proceeds from this show will be donated to our conservation partners lastly i'd like to thank focus right for powering the podcast sound if you'd like to see the gear i use to record the show head on over to rewildology.com and check out nature podcasting under the resources tab until next time friends together we will rewild the planet Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.